Here with Kevin Brooks, Angelo State, uh, Division II, National Champs, ABCA, ATEC, uh, Division II Coach of the Year. Uh, started the program in 05, but had multiple stops as an assistant before Angelo. So, Kevin, thanks for jumping on with me. Oh, man, honored to be here. Appreciate you having us. I know, you know, you all get right into it, recruiting and camp, but have you had a chance to catch your breath at all and reflect? <laughs> no, not really. Um, you know, uh, we 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 still had a little bit of work to do, and then the major league draft happened uh, last week, and uh, while it was great, several of our younger guys got opportunities. Uh, now you got to replace those guys. So uh, haven't really stopped. Uh, I would say I think I had one afternoon on a Saturday when I was driving from one field to another to to watch a game uh, for about 10 minutes, it hit me. I was like, that gum, you know, we did this. So other than that, that's been about it so far. So maybe in November, December, uh, we'll have time to breathe a little bit. Was that expected for you to, to lose those two guys? Uh, we lost three, actually, uh, two, two that got drafted. We expected to lose one. Um, didn't really – we thought the other one, there was a chance – um, but I uh, thought he might escape, uh, didn't. But then the guy we signed to take the place of the one, uh, we were not expecting, and he went in the 10th round. So um, we're, we've been sort of beating the bushes and, and trying to, you know, get Cy Young to fall from the sky. So hopefully that happens. <laughs> well, there's still quite a few guys in the portal, correct? Yes, yes. You know, have, have you leaned heavier on that since it's been available? Uh, no, uh, not really. You know, uh, I, I would say for us, the portal is, has not been a, a great thing just cause we had so many good connections with coaches, um, that they would call us and then, you know, we'd call them and we'd get it done. Now we have to fight against 75 other schools because everybody knows that they're leaving. Um, so for us, it's made it more difficult, I would say. Uh, luckily, on the other end, um, we haven't had anybody leave our program. And obviously, we've had a lot of really good players. But, uh, you know, I think to see the benefit and uh, what we're doing here. And so, you know, they're like, we got better there. Why would we leave? So um, we're really blessed that we hadn't had to deal with that part. So now that Major League Baseball got us a little bit this year. <laughs> I look at Oral Roberts because they uh... – they were in the league with us in the Summit League, and I think it actually helps a school like that because they would get bounce backs, but then they'd have to sit out a year. So I think a school like that, it's actually helped. I know – I don't know how we fix it. Hopefully the NCAA comes in and fixes it. I know they're jumping up levels. That, that's been the, my biggest thing is I don't know why we got rid of having to sit out a year if you move up levels. I think we should still have that, and, and I expressed that to the NCAA when we met with them in Omaha. But I think that more came from the students – than, than it did from the coaches. I think the NSA is leaning more on what the students want. Now, you know, you're trusting that 18 to 23-year-olds know what they want. As we all know, I don't think they exactly know what they want, but I think that's more of what the NSA is thinking is that it's more for the students than it is for the coaches without even thinking how it's going to affect the coaches. Right. Well, and, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an old-school guy. I think it's great if you can find the school you want to go to and, and stay there, you know, and they're – there are good and bad things that happen. Um, obviously, you know, uh, all these rules come a, about because somebody took advantage uh, somewhere. And so then we try to legislate. And, it, you know, I had uh, actually one of a, a conference commissioner several years ago say, you know, it's really difficult to legislate morality. And, uh, you know, and, and so we probably can't do that. So you just hope you've got good people involved that are doing things the right way. Um, and, and ultimately I, what I think we all want is the best experience possible for, for the student athletes. And, uh, you know, uh, grass isn't always greener, uh, sometimes. And that's what you worry about is, you know, the smaller levels, the, the division twos, the division threes were, were not a junior college. And, uh, if we start end up being a junior college, then I, I think that's going to be a really bad thing for, for the game at this level. Have you always had a mix? Looks like you have a, a healthy mix of high school, junior college transfers, and four-year transfers. Has it always been that way for you? Uh, it's changed over the years. You know, when we first started, we had one scholarship. So uh, 
that was that made it difficult. So we're giving a hundred dollars here, two hundred dollars there. And when we first started, felt like we needed to try to be as good as we could be year one. So obviously that required older players. Um, you know, so any money we had, we gave to uh, to junior college guys, or and we had a few four year transfer guys uh, that first year, and then. We got about seven uh, walk-ons uh, that were high school kids. So we didn't give high school kids any money. And then out of that group, you know, that's the thing. We're a new program, Division Two. We're probably not getting the, the cream of the crop on walk-ons. And out of that group, we have four guys get drafted. So um, then we started sort of rethinking. Then our scholarship money went up. Uh, and so then we really did invest highly in high school guys and um, cause we really feel development is, 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 you know, everybody sort of got their thing. Um, we think that's our thing here. That's what we're really good at. Uh, and so the high school guys, uh, you know, like you said, we had a real good mix. I think this year out of our, our starting nine, uh, I believe four or five, you know, were high school guys. And then we had a couple of transfers, uh, it lumped in there and then pitching wise sort of the same way. So um, we've been really good at developing. Obviously most true freshmen probably aren't ready uh, to get on the field and help you win, but generally by their sophomore, junior year, they've been there. And then we've been lucky enough. We've had one or two true freshmen come in and be good enough right off the bat and, and be in the start lineup. And so that sort of takes care of a position there for, for three or four years. And that's always uh a good thing. And it, that's the benefit of baseball too, is with late developing kids. Cause the, the timeline is so different for a lot of kids where a kid might not be a scholarship kid as a high school kid, but you know, a couple years down the road, he might end up being a scholarship kid because he just hasn't gotten there yet. He hasn't figured it out. Right. And, and also too, you know, there's so much change in, in kids' bodies um, between the ages of 16 and 24, 25. And so, um, you know, I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, best example, we, we had a kid, and this was our first recruiting class. He was a 6'6 catcher, uh, ran about an 8 second 60 and threw about 78. Well, by the time he left, he ran a 6'7 60 uh, and threw like 92. We even put him on the mound. And then we moved him to first base uh, where he was a, a gold glover, and he ended up getting drafted, I think, in the 11th round by the, by the Dodgers. So, you know, but he could really hit, you know, that was his one tool he had. Um, and then just physically getting stronger, getting in the weight room caused all those other things to, to eventually happen too. I mean, is that speed development? Is that strength training? Is that maturity? Is it, is it all three? I mean, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat with, with player development. What do you feel like's helped your guys the most? Yeah, I think it's all all three of those things. I think obviously the weight room and the strength program is is hugely important. Um, we've been really good. You know, obviously we're a team that steals a lot of bases uh, and run a lot, so we've been really good at getting fast, really fast, and getting average to fast. Um, you know, I think our average over 19 years is dropping a 60 time three tenths of a second, which that's a huge. Um, when you're talking about that's the average. Um, and, you know, we do a, we, we do the track program. I mean, you know, that's the thing. We do what sprinters do um, and try to get develop that. And then, obviously, our guys uh, have access to facilities and, and hopefully instruction um, that help them get better. And that's that's ultimately what we want to try and do. Has that always been with you? Was that Were you that way as a player? Did you steal a lot of bases? <laughs> I didn't. But I enjoyed watching my teammates do it. <laughs> so uh, no, I was not a guy that could could run real well. Um, I was I, I got a lot faster, um, but you know I'd still say I was never a burner or anything. And uh, but just always, uh, you know, like I say, it, it, you know, we we sort of play to what our personnel gives us. But if you if you let me create my perfect team, it would be a team that that could really run a lot. And so. Um, I just, in, I enjoy it. Um, I think it adds to the excitement of the game. Uh, you know, feel like it puts a lot of pressure on the defense and, um, you can sometimes games just by not losing, let the other team, uh, make some mistakes. So, um, it's something, it's been a, 
style, I guess, I've enjoyed um, from playing um, to getting into coaching. Yeah, 203 stolen bases, by the way. Uh, did that lead? Did, <laughs> that lead uh, did that lead college baseball? Uh, no, we didn't even lead Division Two. Um, so yeah, I, Stillman College, I, and I don't know what they do, but they still like 250 a, a year. So um, they they're always one. But we were on their heels, and that was our goal. I think last year we stole 195. Um, felt like we we could get to 200 this year, and and so we we did. You know, fifth College World Series appearance for you all. Has your style or coaching changed at all being there that many times? You know, have things changed? Yeah, that, for you? actually, it was. It was it, I think that's number six. Is uh, it six? I think. Yeah, yeah, it's six. We've gone five times to carry, and then uh, went once when it was in Montgomery, uh, third year of our program. Um, it has, uh, you know, it, it's first of all, it's so hard to get there. Um, you know, I, as a matter of fact, I was my my mother was uh, down, and she goes, "I remember after that first one, and you and your assistant were talking about um, these are the things we're going to do different." And she was like, "I'm sitting there listening to you, going, you understand? There's there's not going to be a next time. <laughs> this is a, uh, you know, this is really hard to get to, but we've been blessed, and so it does allow us to sort of make some adjustments on things uh, and." you know, we, we did this year and, you know, whether that, that was the difference on why we won or whatever, uh, you know, I hope we get the opportunity to, to try that plan again. I think a lot of it had to do with just, you know, we played well and we got some breaks and those type of things, but, uh, you know, it, it, we've tried to adjust every year and, and maybe we got it right. Finally. Have your assistants been with you the entire time? How long have your assistants been yeah. with you? No, uh, my assistant's currently uh, Adam Foster, who's unbelievable high school coach in the state of Texas that I've been trying to hire uh, since we started the program. And we're finally able to get that done uh, four years ago. And then Sam Moat uh, won a national championship at Iowa Western uh, as an assistant in the junior college ranks. And so he's been here uh, five years. So, uh, you know, real stable staff and uh do an unbelievable job. Is that part of winners win? I mean, when you're high, when you're trying to hire guys, is it guys that have had success? Yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, you know, I think that's the thing in in recruiting too. Not to say we don't recruit guys out of programs that haven't won, but we try that, that it's a smaller percentage. You know, I think um, being around success and being on successful teams uh, does help. You just expect it, you know, and, and now you're what you've probably done the things that allow you to expect that, you know, with your work ethic and, and, and other things. But, uh, you know, that's a big, I think they're better teammates too. Absolutely. I agree. And, you know, that's the thing we got guys in summer ball all across the country and, and obviously talking to a lot of summer coaches and they're like, what do you want us to do? You know, development wise with your guys and, our answer, I think, is a little different. We don't care. We want you to use them to help your team win. It matters to us in the summer. It matters to us in fall inter squads. It matters to us in everything. Because I think when just winning becomes something you're passionate about, you find a way to get it done. And so our whole thing is is geared across that and really every facet. Yeah, because you want that to be a lifestyle, the the 12-month calendar. You want that winning to be a lifestyle. It always drove me crazy when you'd have a guy that struggled in the spring and then they would go out and tear it up in the summertime because a little more laid back for those guys at times. Right. Where, and then you figure out, okay, they're going to probably do the same thing when they get in the spring when the lights are on that they're probably not going to be able to handle it. Right. And there there are guys like that, and uh, you know, you, you try to – Hopefully see them grow and, and, and figure it out at some point. Cade Bragg, Division Two Pitcher of the Year. I mean, did you expect that out of him coming in to the year? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I really did. Uh, you know, he's a, a unbelievable guy. Uh, you know, out of high school, he was he was a big time guy, and then he then he uh, tore the UCL, had surgery, and that sort of set him back, and then. You know, just the biggest thing for Kay, there was so much in there. Uh, you know, actually, I just think it was great. I just read an article about him this morning uh, from the Twins 
uh, just him speaking of what a great job Coach Foster did. He was like, you know, it was all there. I just needed some some coaching. Um, and uh, Coach Foster did an unbelievable job taking something that was great and just proving on a few little things that weren't real complicated. Uh, and then he worked his tail off and he needed to get stronger and get in the weight room and stuff. And he did that. And so he was able to, you know, log a uh, hundred innings, I think, just because we played, you know, an extra six weeks of postseason. Um, and uh, what were some other things he tweaked? Really, what, what were some other things that he and Coach Foster tweaked? Uh, just basically direction. Uh, you know, uh, on just going through the ball state, you know, it, it wasn't, wasn't anything difficult. And then we came up with, uh, just his routine, you know, his long toss routine during the week, uh, you know, his game day routine of what was going to work for him. Um, and we tried a few different things in the fall, found one that seemed to work that he liked and we liked and just stayed with it and just, you know, committed to the plan. And uh, and he did, and we did, and uh, obviously it paid the big dividends for us. Was that end. going out further with his long toss? What what he tweak with his long toss? Uh, just uh, yeah. So we went further, and then uh, he only did it. Uh, I think he'd go two days a week. You know, letting it go. Um, That's a Jager. And, uh, That's Alan Jager. Yeah, Basically yeah. That, the so, hot the hot days are the compression days. Right. And then, you know, in his pull downs and stuff. But uh, anyway, just to, he stayed really healthy, had no problems. And uh, like I say, was was throwing the hardest he threw at the end of the year, which is always our goal. You know, you have a fairly large roster, but it looked like with your stats, you're trying to mix guys in. I mean, I think you had 45 on the roster. It looked like you had 38 or 39 guys get time. So is that by design, too, that you're giving guys opportunities early? Yeah, I mean, uh, really this year too, we didn't, I would say, I always say it takes half the season to sort of figure out who you are and what you are. And then once you sort of do that, then you, you know, so you try to just stay above water the first half. I mean, you, you're going to lose some games because you have the wrong guys in the wrong places at the wrong times. Hey, I mean, now you only gonna... lost seven games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we, we were lucky, and we still found a way to win those. And then uh, once you figure that, but for us, especially on the pitching end, uh, I really feel like it was not until the postseason that we really sort of got guys in, in the right roles and the right times. Uh, so it took us, I mean, really the whole regular season to just guys here and trying guys there uh, to find who the right guys are, first of all. And then uh, second of all, exactly what situations they're going to thrive in. And thought we got that right uh, going into the postseason, and we sort of stayed with it, and it, it worked pretty well. You all have an opening round for your conference tournament? We do. So we have a, a two out of three uh, series. And and basically that was just a way to get more games. You know, the, at Division Two, the NCAA balanced our lives several years ago, which means let's just cut games. Um, so it was a way to try to get some games back. That's a great idea because then you're not sitting around as long too before the conference right. tournament starts. That's a, yep, that's absolutely. a great. I think that's one of the first times I've ever seen that. So I, that was as I'm looking through the schedule, I'm like, oh, they have a, <laughs> they have an opening round for their conference tournament. It's yeah, very cool. So it's good, and then you know it's just a two out of three, and we play four game uh, series all year, so uh, it gives you a chance really to sort of. It, it, we were lucky we were the one seed, not that the eight seed couldn't beat us. They could for sure. Uh, but it allowed us to, you know, I think actually that's where Cade got his first safe. Uh, I think we threw uh, Munson uh, four innings and then threw Cade three. So it was just a seven inning game and then split our three and four up. And then I think we came back and practiced Sunday and, Inter squatted to get everybody else their innings uh, going into the conference, the other conference tournament. That four game series now is it four sevens? Is it two nines and a seven? How's it break down for your yeah, conference? Yeah, so weekend? it's a uh, uh, two nines on on the bookend. So on Friday night it's a nine, and then two sevens on Saturday, and then a nine on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably the best way to do it. Valley, we used yeah. to play three nines. That was a long weekend. Play. Nine Friday, 
a seven inning on Saturday. If it went extras, then the, the next game was a seven on Saturday, and then you played a nine on Sunday. Yeah. Those gotcha. Sunday games yeah. were wild. That was back in the negative five eras, so those Sunday games were always about <laughs> uh, 15 to 18. Yeah, they can be a little of a uh, – uh, you know, it, yeah, whoever plays the least worst sometimes is, is the winner. But that also gives you a chance to use more of your pitchers, too. <laughs> it does. And, uh, you know, that's the one thing. That's always one of our goals, having depth. I think we were undefeated uh, in in those game fours or last games of, of tournaments and all that. And so, um, you know, we were really deep out there. And that that's a big benefit when you get to that last game. Any, any guys coming into the year that you weren't planning on that kind of came to the front? during the year oh uh you know our, our catcher uh tyler boggs and he was the the gold glove recipient uh behind the plate there in division two and uh, really good player but you know he's a guy he'd been here three years we've been to the world series three years in a row and he hadn't gotten to play uh in any of them due to injuries and uh he was coming off a pretty severe arm injury uh to his throwing arm that was just a freak thing where uh he was he was out by a mile last regular season game at third base uh he thought he's a little faster uh than he actually was and so he tried to leap the third baseman and came down and you know did some damage to that arm and so you know he wasn't he's a great catch throw guy but uh we weren't really sure because you know he didn't really uh, get cleared to throw a hundred percent till probably right around February 1st. Um, and, uh, anyway, it took him about a month to get back and then, uh, be, be, uh, you know, getting him back into the starting lineup and getting him there and caught the majority of the games and was just a huge factor, uh, back there defensively, uh, controlling the running game, uh, great blocker receiver and then just handling a really good pitching staff and making those guys uh, perform at their best. And so, uh, like I say, not a surprise, but just with his, his unfortunate luck, <laughs> you know, uh, it was really good to have him back there and, uh, you know, actually caught the final final strike uh, to, to get us uh, the championship. But uh, uh, and then uh, left field, Jacob Guerrero was a, a transfer that we'd had from uh, Sam Houston State, bounced around a little bit. He was a guy that did not have a good fall. I think he hit about a buck ten. Um, and then uh, we worked really hard in individuals there the last month before the fall went home. Uh, came back in the spring and started making some jumps. Uh, got a real good chance to start, I think, uh, our second or third weekend. Uh, had a really good weekend and then just never – came out of the lineup and uh, ended up being a first team all American. So, you know, you, you always hope that, uh, you know, as you pencil in as all Americans before you asked about Cade and I really thought he would be. So, uh, but uh, that was a big thing for us. And uh, he actually hit, you know, the big home run for us and carry uh, in that last game to, to help us win that. So uh, that was probably it, but you know, we felt, we knew we had a good team. Uh, coming in, had a lot of really solid players, and you just hope you know a few of them play at their best. And if so, you got a really good chance of being good. Do you see that a little bit with your bounce back guys? Because obviously they're they're leaving a place for a reason. Either they didn't get to play right. or didn't work out. Do you see that a little bit more with your bounce back guys, where maybe their their tails a little bit between their legs and might take them a little bit to get it figured out? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that because you're right. You know, everybody else is coming because they did great, yeah. right? Whether that's out of high school or junior college. Um, for your transfer guys, generally are coming in because they maybe they didn't play well there yeah. or they just had a little opportunity and somehow they got buried. And so, yeah, you know, I've really never thought of that till you just said that, but I'm going through all the ones we've had in the past and all of them were like that. Um, but you know, you just, it, it, it's a game. You just keep, you keep working. It's generally probably going to reward you. And, and these guys are super talented guys and, and we've been really good at, at getting those bounce back guys, you know, a, a new lease on life. And, uh, they've yeah, it's been, a fresh been able start, to man. It's a fresh start, Do clean slate. Things. Absolutely. Any adversity? I mean, you only lost seven games. Was there any adversity during the year? 
Um, there really wasn't a whole lot, you know. Um, I would say we lost, uh, we split a series uh, early in the year uh, at University of Texas, Tyler, and they've got a really good ball club, and we lost two one-run games, you know, and, uh, and but, we, you know, we didn't lose the series, so, and I think we were 12-0 and 0 or something going into that, so it wasn't too big a deal when you looked at it in the big thing, scheme of things. Uh, then, uh, I would say the regional, you know, and that's the thing every, every year we've gotten to the world series, we've been a few pitches away from our season ended way earlier. Um, and we, we won big, uh, game one of that. It was basically a two out of three. Uh, and then we game two, we jumped out to a three, nothing lead, I mean, boom, right off top first. And, and we beat them pretty bad first game. So you're thinking, here we go again. You know, we're going to we're gonna boat race them. And uh, they made a pitching change, and their guy was unbelievable and shut us out for the next eight and two-thirds. And so we ended up losing four to three. And then uh, game three, you know, which is an elimination game, and we get down, uh, I believe, three or four to nothing. Uh, we had a big bases loaded, nobody out jam in the second where it could have been over, and we were able to limit that to to two runs and keep us in the game. So we're down three nothing. I think going to the sixth or seventh, and then uh, just sort of continued to play and be us, and uh, able to get a a few guys on, do some bunts, do some steals, get a big hit, and uh, eventually came back and took that lead. But you know, I'd say a couple of times during the regular season. Uh, we'd been in those situations and had success in uh, coming back. And so uh, just reminded them of we've been here before, keep doing what we do. Uh, and the guys uh, were able to persevere and get it done. And then beat Mesa, who was as hot as anybody coming into the Supers. You know, you know that was yeah. the matchup for me. I'm like, uh-oh, here are two really, really good teams are going to go out of here for the Supers. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, obviously that that's something. It, it's it's sort of cool because um, we don't play each other in the regular season, but you know, really become probably one of the better better rivalries in Division Two baseball. Because uh, you know, I think we've met every year now for like the last six. Um, can the and, can the selection committee not do something about that? What's that? Can the selection committee not do something about that? Give you both oh, a chance yeah, to go well, to the World Series. Know, too, we got the regional thing, so that <laughs> unless we pick up and move campus sites, we're probably going to be stuck. But uh, you know, it's always the battle of of uh, and you know their offense is always really really good. Um, you know, I, I, sometimes I get uh, you know I'm like, well, our offense is really really good too. I mean, it's 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 you know I think we're third or something in the country in, in run scored. We just do it a little different way. Um, we don't hit as many home runs. <clears throat> so it's always interesting to see the battle of what is built as, you know, our pitching versus their hitting. And, uh, you know, uh, the general saying is good pitching beats good hitting most days. And uh, this year we were able to do that. And then offensively uh, did a did a good too. So, you know, Coach Hanks and those guys are always unbelievable. Love playing against them because they compete really well and do things the right way. But, uh, you know, that's the first time we hadn't had to go to game three ever uh, either way with those guys. So it was nice to get it done in two. <laughs> well, and only 33 airs on the year. I mean, nine, feeling 984. Yeah, that was uh, – we were so good defensively. Uh, like I said, we make the routine plays, uh, but yet we make the great plays too. And so as a pitcher, uh, it really makes you feel good. I mean, you know, you basically keep the ball in the ballpark and you're probably going to get an out. Uh, and so that's one thing, again, just got to give uh, – Coach Moat works a lot uh, with our uh, defensive part of the game, and he is unbelievable. You know, we've been – top in the country uh in fielding percentage pretty much every year uh since he's gotten here and and does an unbelievable job with those guys 
Are you doing some of the things at Iowa Western? Are you doing the live ball, dead ball, BP? Are you doing the any of the tee work stuff where guys are hitting ground balls at each other off the tee? Because I know Iowa, I know Coach Reardon was big on that stuff at, at Iowa Western. Yeah, we do the uh, the tee ground ball thing, the point game. I don't know if you're familiar yep. uh, with the point game. That you know, for us, that really works with the way we run the bases. Um, it's been a great thing. So I could say, I mean, that's why you. You try to hire good coaches from good programs because, you know, you, I'm old and set in my way sometimes. So, I, I, I mean, that's why I hire him. I want to yeah. try to get better just like everybody else. And uh, he's done a great job of bringing some great things, as is Coach Foster. You know, when you take over in 05, you only have one scholarship. I mean, you'd been at Division One schools before that. I mean, was Angelo State just an attractive job, even though you're going to have one scholarship? Yeah, it really was. Um, I'd never been here <laughs> until then. Uh, I think I maybe stopped at a convenience store going to play tech uh, when I was at Baylor as a player. But uh, it, it's just uh, they they built uh, a new stadium several years earlier, and it was an independent team's uh, stadium. And so at, at that time, it was sort of starting to get run down a little bit and long story but you know we got control of that about five or six years ago and redid everything so it, it it's one of the best facilities ever um the town really supports uh all their sports really well but really baseball especially and then the school and so uh we're a little geographically isolated um because we're really about three hours in every direction from any big town. We're the biggest city in Texas without a major interstate running to it. But so it's an effort to get here. Um, but, you know, wanted to be a head coach. One, uh, the Lone Star Conference, I knew how good of baseball it was. Uh, and, yeah, I felt like we'd have a chance if we worked hard uh, to be good and be good quick. And, uh, you know, luckily that's been able to happen. Did you have to do much fundraising to get the stadium back in good shape? Uh, we, we raised about 5 million, but, uh, and I was involved with a little bit, but again, we just got people around here that are so invested, uh, in the baseball program and in the university, uh, that should be a really hard thing to do. And it, it's not because of the generosity of, of a lot of great people. So, I mean, with 45 guys coming in the fall and you said you had some guys that maybe didn't play well in the fall, when are you setting roles for guys? Or are you well, just letting it play uh, out? You know, we always tell guys uh, from the beginning, you know, the roles are going to probably change uh, as the season goes along up until probably that last out's made. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're going to you're gonna have to handle whatever your role is that day. And, and sometimes, you know, you're talking about a redshirt freshman, you know, his job is to – get the field set up for the game that day. Well, seems inconsequential, but, you know, if it's not done, then the guys that are playing that day, you know, don't have a place to play. And so I think you've got to, you know, I, I worked under Mark Johnson at, at Texas A&M and actually got to have uh, dinner with him this weekend when I was out recruiting. And uh, just one of the things I learned from him so that was so valuable was – making everybody that's involved feel worth and, and know they're a major piece of the success of the group because it's true. It's true. You know, I mean, like I said, I, it, and I think it helps. I was not a good player. Um, you know, I was the guy that was in charge of bringing the bats. That way the good dudes would have their bats to swing. And, uh, but you know, so I think I identify with those guys a little bit. And I think that, that hopefully does, uh, in, in showing them how valuable they are. And then it's really easy uh, when you can use examples of players now that are that are in those positions. They're on the field. They're big contributors. But they weren't when they first got here. And they just continued to work and continued to improve. And now, hey, here's where this guy's at. So that can be you. It doesn't happen to everybody. You know, hard work doesn't guarantee success. But – I feel like you got a lot better chance if you do. And so uh, that was one of the big worries because we're still backed up a little bit with the COVID on our roster size. And so, you know, the guys that don't play K-12 
can can wreck the ship uh, uh, really quick, and they sometimes have a bigger influence on team culture than the guys that are in there. And so uh, we try to make sure we show how valuable they are, and also to, they truly do have hope that you know they're they're getting a fair shot. We're doing everything we can to get them better, just like everybody else. And uh, it, it was amazing though, because that was a big concern of our coaching staff going in. Uh, and we just didn't have one problem. Everybody bought in big time. And, you know, at the end, everybody gets the same ring. So, you know, 20 years from now, you can go tell whatever you want. <laughs> at Baylor, did you know you wanted to coach? Yes, uh, I sure did. And so, uh, you know, back then, Mickey Sullivan was uh, our head coach, uh, Bill Bratcher, and then Sid Hudson was uh, our pitching guy. And I was not a pitcher, but uh, I went down that bullpen every day. I mean, that's a guy I played with like Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth and stuff and, uh, you know, would just go pick his brain about anything. And he was so good to me, uh, showing me how to throw this or throw that or answer a question about what you're thinking here uh, from a pitcher's perspective. And and then Coach Sullivan, you know, from him, every player would go through a wall for that guy. Um, and so he just loved his players and his players loved him back. And, um, you know, like I say, so I learned so much and was really trying to sort of, as a player, you know, try to just sort of pick things up from a lot of great coaches and players that I was around. And so, um, but yeah, even back then I was, I was sort of putting things in the memory bank. Yeah. Which stop as an assistant taught you the most? Uh, Texas A&M uh, under Coach Johnson. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer uh for a reason and uh first as a person but you know so that's the one thing i you know i i didn't make any money and then i finally i, I went to incarnate word uh after I, I i left baylor and graduated and stuff and and got a full-time job was the full-time assistant and i think i was making like forty thousand, which oh, wow you know Good for you back then <laughs> And for me, I was like, it's a ton you know, now for I, some of us. I thought I was rich and then uh, ran into Jim Lawler, the pitching coach uh, down there recruiting. And he's like, hey, would you be interested in, in something at our place? And I was like, yeah. So next morning, Coach Johnson called and said, hey, we've got a, a volunteer position. And I'm like, OK, so back to making zero again. But. You know, I thought long. I, I needed to go to a place that had all the resources, and so you, you know, because you sort of figure you're gonna be at a place in your career that doesn't have all the resources. But if you can be behind at a place that does, you can sort of prioritize and go, okay, well, what is the most important here? And, and then, and then just learning uh, how to do things from a guy that had, had tremendous amount of success. So. Um, I you think know, Coach Lawler is one of the p best pitching minds we've ever had, too. Oh, yeah. he's. I stole so many throwing drills from him. When he was at Little Rock, <laughs> I was at Iowa, and I would just – I paid attention to a lot of what other coaches were doing. I would zero in on him when he would go out with the pitcher while they were playing catch. I stole a bunch of stuff, yep. even though I was coaching infielders at the time. I stole a bunch of drills from him and added into our infield catch play. Yeah, Coach Lawler, like I say, he, and he's always thinking and creating too. So uh, being around those guys was uh, just, like I say, an invaluable tool for me. Uh, and, I mean, I think I got a different little screen background, but behind me is about 20 notebooks of practice plans from – from A and M, UTSA, Incarnate Word, uh, everything we've done here. So I did, I did loose cool. elbows with the campers and and camp last yeah, week. Yeah. We did. I got that from Coach Lawler. We're doing <laughs> loose elbows. <laughs> uh, he's an awesome guy. Do you talk about winning a national championship? I mean, it's your first. Did you talk about winning a national championship with your guys? Yeah, uh, we've talked about it every year since two thousand five. Um, you know, and I think that's the one thing. It's a realistic goal for us starting every year. Um, it's so far away, though, when you're talking about it at first. And we understand it's a lot of being great todays to hopefully put us in that position. But, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I think to get there and ultimately do it, it's got to be something you think about. And it's got to be the ultimate goal. you got to understand all the smaller goals um, you know, and that was one thing we did 
you know, when we got there this year was uh, and now it's close. You know, you're you're 10 days or so away from uh, that last out being recorded for whoever wins it. And, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, in which we hadn't done in the past is like, OK, we're here um, 10 days from now. I mean, what do you got to do? Let's picture doing it and all that stuff. And I think this group, uh, we've had a lot of guys that have been uh, before. And, you know, I think that's what's always so difficult because it is such a great accomplishment to get there. <clears throat> but to uh, to not be satisfied with getting there, to not be satisfied unless you win the whole thing. And, you know, our, I know our guys that have been there before, like we are not coming back without that trophy this time. And uh, they're pretty determined to get there. Do you feel like that allows your players to course correct from a discipline standpoint and accountability standpoint? You know, you even talk about like your role guys, but do you feel like talking about a national championship allows guys to maybe course correct? Not that they're going to, you know, not do what they're supposed to do, but that's always the case with 18 to 23 year olds at times. Do you feel like that helps them course correct a little bit that, okay, here's what ultimately what we're trying to get to and here's what I need to do get to get there? To get us there yeah i do and i think everybody's bought in towards a common goal and uh you know it, it, and all of us you know we're not going to be perfect the goal is to be perfect um you know we're going to make mistakes along the way uh whether those are just you know we made a mistake or making a conscious choice to, a bad one at the time uh the good news is you know fix it as soon as you can and turn around and you know that's the one thing uh We've got, you know, we go through and I don't know if you can sort of see that gold dot there on my watch, but that's something, um, you know, all our guys, we talk about what it means and, and it's just a reminder whether they put it on their phone, they put it on something they see regularly. Um, for me, it's my watch and, uh, you know, just when I look and see what time it is, I see that gold dot every time and it just refocuses me, okay, here's our goals, here's what we want to do. And, and, you know, hopefully reminds me of, of what we're doing. So it's sort of a constant reminder. Um, and then our guys are so great at holding each other accountable. Uh, it's gotten to the point now as a coach, I mean, we really don't do much. Just try not to get out of their way and don't screw it up. It's sort of our job. When do you introduce that gold dot to them? Uh, at the end of the fall. So once we finish our fall, it's our last meeting before uh, we go home for Christmas. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, you know, we go through what it, what it means and, and what it's about. And then, you know, they're getting ready for us, you know, Christmas break is about as long as summer. So that's, and it's really important because we only have about three weeks of practice and then the games start and they count. Um, and so, uh, just making sure they, they do what they're supposed to do, stay on their workout routine. Uh, again, check on each other, make sure they're staying on their workout routine, et cetera, and make sure we're all ready to go. Um, so we wait till the fall, um, also too, in case there's any attrition or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's become a pretty big deal to, to our guys and our team. Do you feel like the offense is finally caught up to pitching? It seemed like pitchers were, were giving it to hitters for a while, but it seems like the offenses have caught up. Yeah, it does. Um, this year, you know, the last couple of years, and obviously the, I don't know if the bats have gotten better, uh, if we've gotten just, you know, obviously everybody knows how to train better and, and players are bigger, faster, stronger. Um, but you're obviously seeing a lot more home runs uh, now. You know, we even, you know, we changed the ball and went to the flat seam ball because the balance was off uh, when we changed the bat. So, uh, it seems like the balance is is starting to tilt a little bit back towards the offensive side, um, and uh, I, you know, which is crazy. Just with you know the velocities that seems like everybody throws nowadays, but I think it goes back to sort of you know some age old baseball things. You got to throw strikes. You got to be able to locate, and you got to be able to change speeds. And uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, if the current generation, if we have is the numbers of guys that are able to do that right now, I think they're very good at throwing the ball hard. Um, but being able to pitch and be able to do all those things, I think probably has something to do with it as well. 
I think it's starting to come back on the mound too, from a command standpoint. I don't, I don't see as many guys spraying the ball. Um, you know, it seemed like for about four or five years ago, you know, it just seemed like guys were spraying the ball around, but now it seems like guys might be missing their spots, but they're not spraying it around. I think that's starting to come back a little bit more too. I think bat to ball skills are coming back and I think command for, for pitchers are starting to come back. I, I agree. Um, you know, I think that's, and I'm excited about that. Uh, you know, I've never, uh, uh the, I mean, I love shaking dudes hands coming around third and on a home run. Believe me, I love those, but it just, I've always felt like, you know, when you start facing the better pitching more difficult to square it up because they're really good. Um, and so you got to be able to, you know, I think that's the thing in baseball to truly have a chance to, to win a national championship, I think you got to be able to win a lot of games in a lot of different ways. Um, especially with, you know, you may show up and the wind's blowing out 50. Uh, well, then you better hit some home runs that day. But you show up and the wind's blowing in 50. Now you got to figure out how you're going to score one and, and keep the other team at zero. So uh, there's so much versatility from day to day that's required. Uh, of your players and as a team, I think the more versatile you can be, the better. So I think it's good that that the game is getting where you've got a lot of guys with a lot of different skill sets that can use uh, as needed. With your running now, everybody on their own, you allow them freedom, uh, or are they, you, are they relying on you? Uh, I would say probably eighty percent of the steals are green lights. Um, so. Um, it's a lot. We try to do a really good job of teaching it when to go, when not to go. Uh, but, but yeah, most of it's, it's them, not, not, not me. That was the hard part for me. Oh. I stole a lot of bases and then you'd get into summer ball with coaches that wanted for you to wait to get, right. to get the sign. And that was really hard for me as a guy that had grown up being on green light, basically the entire time that I played, that was difficult for me because then you're kind of waiting instead of hunting to try to steal right. bases. You know, it just felt like it helped me as a player if I was on my own because I, I had good feel for stealing of just being able to hunt uh, rather than waiting for somebody to give it to me. Right. And that's one thing, you know, just mentality wise, um, you just got to sort of establish. And so for us in the fall, like when we enter squad, you got to go in the first three pitches or you're out. And, uh, and then if you are out, you get to go back to, and try it again. Like you got to get thrown out twice and then in and for it to actually count. Um, Love it. But just getting that mentality and then learning from success and failure. And I think, uh, you know, it's a great teaching tool. Helps your defense too. Cause then you have to learn how to stop it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I hate playing people that play like us. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's great though. On both sides, making somebody uncomfortable or feeling on un, feeling uncomfortable with that is, is good. It, it, it forces you to get better. Absolutely. What inspired you to get your master's degree? Well, back then you sort of had to have it to coach in college, you know? Um, now sometimes you don't even need a, a undergrad. So, I wish I would have taken that route. I was in school, I felt like, for about 30 years. Um, you know, just, uh, again, wanted to coach in college also at that time. Uh, you know, that was really uh, the first year. So I remember when I was at Baylor, you know, there weren't computers and stuff. So I wrote a letter uh, to every uh, Division One school in the country, and that was just the time that GAs had really gone away and they – They'd gone to the minimum earnings uh, guy. Restricted earnings. Uh, yeah. And so uh, I remember I, I wrote a letter. To, I got two two replies back. I got one from uh, Ron Polk at Mississippi State and got one back from Norm DeBron at Arkansas. And, uh, you know, they're like, sorry, we don't have anything. I mean, it's nice rejection letters. Uh, and then uh, got that opportunity, Incarnate Word, and, you know, they were uh, not Division One. They're Division One now. But back then, and uh, you know, it paid for my school and got me a place to live and uh, made three or $400 a month. And, you know, like I said, thought I was pretty rich uh, starting out. Plus, just the opportunity to, to coach. And Steve Hine uh, was gracious enough to, to hire me there. And then, then Danny Heap took over a few years and Danny, you know, played in the big leagues for 16, 18 years, uh, 18 years and won a couple of world series. And so, uh, really great guys to learn from 
And then the good thing, you know, we're just not staffed as good at that level. And so it gave me an opportunity to go out and recruit and, you know, plan practices and just do lots of things. Um, now, I had to learn, I'm sure, from a lot of mistakes I made, but uh, it was a great place to start and just learn a whole lot and have a whole lot of responsibility uh, as, a, as a young kid, really, coming out that was pretty green. And uh, so, I, you know, that's basically why I got my master's and, you know, glad I got it. Now, I guess I'm not quite a doctor, but a master. We need to bring it back. <laughs> Uh, I think yeah. we need to bring the GA. Everybody should have at least I'll one GA. It's it's the best yeah. entry point for, you know, it's hard now, Division One. you know, you, you, you're not going to give a first-year kid a full-time job. You're just not. Like, so right. it, it's an entry-level position for somebody that's trying to figure it out. I'm sure you were similar to me. You're going to figure out in a month whether you want to keep coaching college baseball or not. Right. You know, but yeah, th those exactly. guys that are just getting into it, they don't know. I mean, you, you think you want to do it, but until you actually get in, get on the road and do all those things, you don't know for sure if that if that's what you want to do. It's a it's a not that it's painless, but it's more of a painless way to get somebody an entry level job into college coaching to see if they want to do it and see if they're good too. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I, I hope that comes out. We're lucky; we still have uh, you know that position, and I think it's great. And that, you know, it's so cool where our guys have gone off to, too. I mean, they've, they're all doing great, and they're all in either college or professional baseball. And, uh, you know, it, it it makes us feel good, you know, that we had a place for them to get that foot in the door, and then they took it and ran with it. And so uh, very proud of all those guys. Where are the first places with those new guys from a mentorship standpoint, where are the first places you're starting with them when you get somebody new from a GA standpoint? Uh, well, uh, again, try to bring them into our, you know, they generally arrive here around, uh, you know, they're generally here for two years, sometimes three. Um, but when we cycle them back out, uh, they generally get here about August 1st. And then just, you know, having them involved in, in all the, the coaches meetings and stuff where, you know, we're going over responsibilities. And, and then we generally, you know, we put them in charge of a position group. Um, you know, whether that's catchers, outfielders, infielders, uh, pitchers, uh, you know, helping with that. Um, but then we, you know, we take them through and go, okay, this is how we want it taught. And we take them out, I mean, I'm, or what do you want to do with it? You know, depending on how much experience and stuff. And I generally go out there with them just like I'm a player and hit me balls and, you know, this is what you're looking for on this. And when we're talking about a drop step in the outfield, okay, um, these are the key things to sort of look for. And then uh, then we start with uh, individuals, you know, probably the first two or three weeks. And so we just try to go and not, you know, it's not out there your first time as a young coach and the head coach or the assistant coach is standing there watching, you know. Um, so – Try to not be that type of figure, but be there to help and observe and give them suggestions on this is how we get better. Um, obviously, you know, just talking to them daily, daily, you know, daily interactions of, you know, hey, do you have any questions about this and this and this? And then I think we 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 all feel really free of come ask us like, you know, I get a dude thrown out first and second, nobody out in the seventh, and we're still in third with our three-hole hitter up. I'm not – come ask me after the game. Maybe give me 30 minutes after the game. Uh, but, you know, ask me and I'll tell you why I thought it was a good idea. You know, uh, may not have worked out that way. But uh, anyway, and so I think that the freedom of that and then uh, getting them to help, you know, unfortunately helping with – travel arrangements and and just equipment and all those things that hopefully they're all going to advance and that that's going to be valuable experience so we try to give them everything but you know we let them uh take control of, of their group try to help them be better at it but they've got a lot of responsibility in recruiting in um getting them out as much as possible because that's how they're going to get their next job uh is by meeting people and and making evaluations on players, et cetera. So do you feel like that keeps you sharp 
as a head coach that you're having to mentor some young assistants, you know, every two to three years? Where yeah, you're absolutely. Kind of retraining yeah. yourself to, to what they're seeing too. And not taking, yeah, you know, I is. think you're not taking it for granted then. No, and I think, um, yeah, it's probably helped me on my communication just be better. Because, um, you know, I think all of them have different styles of, of receiving the communication. And so you've got to adjust and learn how they, they learn best. You know, sometimes it's showing, sometimes it's verbal, sometimes it's, it's whatever. And so trying all those things and then having to learn different, different ways to communicate effectively. Do you have a fail forward moment? Do you have something you thought was going to sidetrack you, but looking back now, it helped you move forward? Uh, I don't think I do. Uh, I mean, was no. there any hesitation at, at leaving Division One? Mm, no, no. I mean, I, I would say since I've been here, I've had a, a lot of opportunities to to go back uh, to Division One and. You know, I hadn't gone because I'm in a better situation, in my opinion, whether that's true or not. Um, you know, it's up to to, whom, to whomever. And since I guess I'm the guy living the life, uh, it's it's my decision. But uh, no, uh, you know, uh, you know, Coach John, again, you know, he told me once, don't ever mess with happy. So uh, try not to mess with happy. I take each day. You know, uh, I'm not saying, that, you know, today there's not going to be the greatest opportunity in the world. And I think that and, and, and we take it. But, um, you know, I think that's just, the key to being successful. That's why I asked that question, because I think people that are successful, they view those they don't view those setbacks as failures. They, they right. view them as a learning opportunity, an opportunity to get better. And that's why I love asking that question, because people that are really successful, you haven't had a losing season. I think people that are really successful, I just think they view it different than, than other people. Well, I, yeah, I mean, believe me, I've, I've had my share of days that aren't good. And, you know, we've had some seasons that, that aren't where we want, but I do think, you know, you try to learn from it and then uh, get better. And that's, that's all you can do every day. So uh, try to hopefully live life like that too. Any routines that you have morning or evening that you do every day that you feel like help? Oh, I mean, I get up. Uh, very first thing I do is 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 pray and and read my Bible. I think that is, uh, you know, spending time with with God is uh, the most important part of the day. Um, so try to make sure I, I start my day correct uh, that way, and uh, you know, ask questions and try to listen and and all those things. And uh, how long have you, you done know, that? How long have you started your morning with the Bible? Oh gosh, uh, 25, 30 years, probably. Do you find that on time. your own or does somebody nudge you to, to do that? Uh, you know, well, I grew up, you know, going to church and, and was a part of a church. And then, uh, you know, I think at a camp or something, it might've been disciple now, you know, when I was maybe eighth grade, ninth grade, something like that, you know, talked about that and I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And so, uh, do try to start every day that way. Um, you know, I'm pretty, pretty good. Uh, most of the time, I mean, they're not going say I'm perfect, boy, believe me, I screw up, but, uh, I think that, um, you know, that's really one of my routines. It's, it's always funny. I generally, you know, probably get the office around eight thirty or nine, uh, because once you hit 10 o'clock, you got your list of the things you're going to do and you better get them done between 8 30 and 9 45 because it, it's just every day 10 o'clock uh you know whenever you end up leaving those things on the list are you doing and so uh it's so funny my my daughter i've got one left in in high school and she should be a junior and we we're just talking one day and she was like hey what do you do at work <laughs> and i was like well, what do you think I do? I'm just curious. What do you think I do? And she's like, well, I think you get there, you go sit in the dugout, you, you know, you yell at some people, then you walk around, maybe do some typing, and then you come home. And I was like, okay, well, that, I, that pretty much sums it up. Sure. That, that is the day. But anyway, I thought it was funny. I was like, I need to bring, the, bring no your kid to work. Yeah. So anyways, it, but you know, it, it, 
I like, I'm a very routine oriented person as we all are in baseball, I think. Um, But yet I also like the part of you've got a lot of things that aren't routine that come up throughout every day and throughout a season and, and having to jump, you know, from one place to another. So I think it's both, but, um, what do you use for a calendar? What do you use for, sir? What do you use for a calendar? Calendar. Uh, (laughs) I had, uh, I do put things in my phone. You're really good. If you can do it out of your head. Oof. Yeah. But most of it's just in my head. I can, uh, I, I can do all that, but I, I've gotten older, but my problem is I'm so bad in technology. When I put stuff in the phone, it's wrong. So I, I'll put it on the wrong date or the wrong time. And uh, so I've gotten, uh, it's better. I mean, I'm generally right in my head and I'll check the phone and it's wrong. So, uh, but yeah, I just pretty much do it, do it in my head. It's part of finding what works for you. Yes, Just absolutely. find what works for you from an organization standpoint. Yeah. And so, and, and I am, I mean, I write down a lot of stuff too, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm not great on the computer. Uh, I use it, but, uh, I don't store all my stuff on there. Any changes for division two baseball you'd like to see? Well, yeah. Um, I thought, you know, when we went to the regional super regional format, uh, five years ago, six years ago, I thought that was huge. And I luckily was on, uh, I was on the committee at that time to, to, to help get that through. And we had a lot of lot minded folk. Um, you know, I, I would like to get our games back. Uh, uh, really, um, you know, we're, we've got a push right now to, uh, to just add two. And uh, hopefully that'll get to the NCAA floor, not this year, but the following year and, and that'll get passed. And then um, just our fall, you know, so our fall, they cut that a little bit by five hours. And so what I think is what's happening at most places is those are coming away from strength and conditioning. And so guys are just doing it on their own because if they're, if you're supervising that you're probably going to go over your number of hours and people would rather use that time on the field for skill development, et cetera. Um, And so one, I think it's just dangerous for the student athlete to be over there, not, being supervised real closely and not being monitored. And so love to see that. And those are two things I know uh, through the NCAA, the coaches connection and, and through the help of the ABCA and a lot of other people, um, we're trying to get those to the floor and get some backing. And, you know, that would cost no money, which uh, so that that generally ups, uh, you know, the, the appeal. You got to get your and, sack involved with it. Once the, once yeah. the students start pushing for it then it yes, usually gets I, done, you know, and, and that's a, that's a student yeah. athlete experience thing. Like, you know, you, you have, your kids want to play baseball. Well, They want to be around it. That's the big, that's thing. what administrators don't understand they is do. they want to be around it. They want to be able to experience as much as they can. Yes. And they all have a passion to be great at it. And that's the, the one thing that, you know, uh, I mean, our, our facility, luckily a great facility and it's available and they come work whenever they work. And there are guys in here all day, every day, not required. I mean, you know, not just on their own because they want to be great at something. And, you know, to me, we should give the opportunity to do that as much as possible to everybody. And they're all great students. They're doing their, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, I sort of feel like if they're in class or if they're at the baseball field, that's a lot better place for them to be than other places. Yes. So I think, again, it's it, it's a great thing. Yep. What are some final thoughts before I let you go? Well, one, I just appreciate you uh, having us on. I mean, uh, it's been a great experience. I always enjoy talking about Angelo State and, and, and our players and just all the success, you know. Uh, I'm just so excited. I love – you know, college baseball, uh, I think in the last 10 to 15 years, I think a lot of schools are starting to realize the value uh, it can have upon a university. Uh, and I think that's just one thing that, that maybe we as coaches uh, got to, con- we've done a lot better job. We've got to continue to show how vi- valuable we are. And uh, hopefully that will continue to cause improvements in the sport and continue to grow the game. Thanks for your time, Coach.
All right. Thank you. Enjoyed it.